Hello folks, I hope you're all well. I have some light entertainment for you today. Uh, I was recently invited onto the 9 to 42 podcast, which is a podcast uh, created by the guys behind The Guitar Show, which is the UK's largest annual guitar event. They've had some really, really cool guests on there previously, uh, including guys like Chris Buck, Phil X, Paul Stanley from Kiss, Misha Mansour, as well as a bunch of uh, gear manufacturers uh, like Thorpe FX, Rift Amps, Eastman Guitars, all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and I sat down with Ant and Jay to talk about the 80s, obviously, um, as well as kind of the ever-changing landscape of music at the moment, a little bit about where I come from and some of my projects, and of course, some of our favorite session guitar players. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, I really enjoyed sitting down with these guys, I actually work with Jace at BIM, so it was nice to hang in a non-educational kind of setting. Um, and I implore you to check out some other episodes on the podcast because it's, it's really enjoyable listening. They're great guys. And I've been finding myself listening to it a lot um, in the car. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I will be back soon with another lesson for you guys. I'm glad you enjoyed the one on modes. I'm going to be doing like a little bit more theory stuff mixed in amongst all of the 80s sessiony stuff. Um, but enjoy the rest of your weekend and I will see you soon. Bye bye. Our, uh, our guest tonight is Rich Watson. And Rich is a session guitarist, a YouTuber, a purveyor of phenomenal knitwear. And I got it in with no kind of, you know, no kind no. of glitch there. Haven't got to edit it out. Um, but before we start and say hello to Rich, I I searched Rich Watson YouTube, put it into Google, right? Mm. Okay. And I wasn't aware that you had something on mudlarking and metal detecting. Because <laughs> that's the first thing that comes up. How have you kept that quiet? I thought you were going to say the old blues guy that I think is actually... He, he might have actually passed away now. So I uh, know the, the metal detecting is news to me as well. Yeah, you are the dead son of Doc Watson, uh, the bluegrass player, aren't you? You know, Spotify, I had some of my own music up on Spotify and they kindly merged our catalogs together. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to log in one day and um, suddenly I had access to all of <laughs> Doc Watson's <laughs> Spotify stats. <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. And did that um, bring you a royalty check that went up from 73 pence to, you know, £1.12? <laughs> well, my conscience got the better of me and I flagged it, um, which is perhaps a mistake. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I think you do right. Musicians need to stick together. Um, we, we start, we'll start with our normal kind of uh, entry in. Uh, and, and actually, on the day that effectively COVID is now finished... As far as as far as our government's concerned, how's how's COVID been for you? How's the lockdown been for you? Surprisingly good, oddly. Um, I mean, obviously the the gigging thing was devastating, um, but it, it kind of led to me getting to do some things which I'd wanted to do for a while, and one of them was doing a lot more kind of remote recording projects. I've been doing a great kind of ongoing album project with a Canadian artist, and it's all kind of like. 80s AOR which is obviously right up my street so between that and sort of you know the lecturing at the same place where Jace also lectures and doing the YouTube thing I've uh, been kept sort of fairly busy really so I, I certainly don't feel like I have anything to complain about. Well actually that's quite interesting because I was chatting today to Chris Woods who we had on the podcast a, a few episodes back and we were talking about whether we thought um, electric guitars were on the way back in 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 you know with real purpose because I seem to have noticed a lot more guitar format bands of the, in the last two or three years. Now you've just mentioned an AOR project, but mm. but I am starting to hear that coming back. Am I imagining that, or is that is that a thing? No, you're not. You're not. Um, that that sound is coming back as well. There seems to be a bit of a resurgence within the guitar of that that eighties thing. It kind of became terribly uncool. Yeah. in the early 90s and it seems to be kind of making its way back around again and I'm starting to see more and more rack systems popping back up and a lot more chorus going on so yeah it probably is due for a little bit of a resurgence from that sort of decade I guess 
Well, and pointy headstocks as well. I'm starting to see a few more pointy headstocks around. I'm just relieved to see headstocks back, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm not. So I'm not imagining it then. This is a. This is a definitely a thing. It seems to be. Yeah, right. it seems to be. Just at the point where I'm incapable of growing my hair again. <laughs> it's it's coming back round. <laughs> oh, poor Ant. You, you yeah. could grow it again. It just won't look like it did. No, it won't. No. It'll look like when Paul Weller grew his out. Oh, you look like your nan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could I could see some kind of extension situation happening, perhaps. <laughs> I think that's a phrase we ought to it might, leave behind. Might, <laughs> might be <laughs> hospitalised, but... Um... I suppose that leads us into quite nicely, which is the thing that we really wanted to talk about was session heroes. Sure. And and when I when I asked you if you want to do the podcast and I said to you, you really confused me because you're about 20 years younger and you listen to all of that and replicate all of those sounds that were when I was a teenager, which, <laughs> let's be honest, was quite a long time ago now. So you have a YouTube playlist because you've got a YouTube channel, haven't you, which is yeah. Richard Watson. I think. Yeah, that's right. You got um, and you've got various playlists. So there's, there's covers on it. There's um, many, many walkthroughs of your pedal board. And it's evolving pedal board, um, which is, it was actually quite interesting. There was top 10 tips that I watched today of pedal boarding. Uh, only because I bought two new pedals today. And here we are. Ooh, just to show you. What have you, what have you got? So I've got uh, uh, an acoustic preverb fender pedal because i've got an okay. acoustic gig coming up so ah. it's a preamp and a reverb pedal in one cool. and uh i'm assuming you pronounce it muir yellow comp compression pedal to cool. go on my new acoustic pedal board that i'm building very cool yeah so anyway enough about my purchases from today <laughs> um yeah so uh session heroes how, why, what? Um, go. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, oh, it depends. How, how far back do you want to go with this? Well, I watched a very, very young Rich Watson on episode one of oh. Session Heroes, which looked right. like you were in a cupboard, <laughs> frankly, recording it. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, let's go, go back to the start. Yeah, I mean, I'd um, I'd sort of become a bit, fixated on those sorts of players for for a, a good kind of two or three years or so before I started doing it and those videos were really just born out of frustration of not feeling like those guys were really it's not even like they're not recognized exactly but you really have to kind of like scratch around to find lots of information on them you know it's not mm. kind of like localized to one place and I, I just I always felt like they were such an important part of the history of music. And it's not just the eighties guys. It go, this goes back to like the sixties. I just had this kind of overwhelming sort of sense that I, I just wanted to do something with it. I wanted to bring more people's attention to it. I wanted to teach more of the stuff, you know? Um, Cause it's, it, it's kind of like an era of music that's been like with me from the beginning really. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of it, it. It's something which is like evolved. I did I did the first episode just before I went out to LA for like a couple of weeks, and actually got to go and see Michael Land out the Big Potato and see Scott Henderson and stuff like that. And then it's kind of become a bigger and bigger focus of the stuff that I will do online. And originally it was these kind of longer episodes where it would give you like a bit of background about the player's life and how they got started and kind of picking up on a, a few kind of key highlights from their discography and demonstrating sounds, talking a bit about their rigs. And then it's kind of like, I don't know, I suppose it's diversified into uh, some more digestible stuff because most of those things are like 20 minutes of complete dorkery, basically. <laughs> <laughs> no, I found, it, I found it quite interesting to say it cause, because it is the kind of the music of my teenage years. I'm aware of them, I think, because, you know, I bought guitar magazines in the 80s and they were featured, like you say, no one talks about them now, but they certainly did then sort mm. of thing. But it just, to me, it just seems so 
incredibly out of touch, I suppose, at the time, because that rack gear would have cost thousands. And I was scratching around with a little uh, solid state Fender amp, which is what I was gigging with. And it, it, it just, I think it is really interesting. It's a really interesting part of the guitar's development over the last, well, certainly that decade, but probably the the mid to late 70s through to uh, Nirvana, basically, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, son- sonically, for sure. It was definitely like a, a, a moment and it's it's so it's so recognizable and it's sort of dated quite quickly and then has come sort of back around mm. um but i mean the the sound is only really like a part of it the whole the whole session musician thing i mean those those guys actually you know people were aware of how much they were doing um people like Luther and the the Picaro brothers it was well known you know they were playing on everybody's records but, but before that the sort of the generations before um Session musicians are really kind of like hidden away. If we're talking about like um, the Wrecking Crew, which was in like the 60s, those guys were were regularly flown in to sort of um, basically, you know, play on things like uh, the Beach Boys records or, um, you know, the Righteous Brothers or Sonny and Cher. And and majority of the time they, they weren't credited for their work at all. They weren't even on the, you know, the, the album credits. Um, and it's kind of like every decade has has its own group of guys. It started off, I mean, sort of Tommy Tedesco and Glenn Campbell. They were the first kind of rock star session musicians, really. Before that, it was really kind of the whole the whole job was confined more to like readers and jazzers, and it's kind of you turn up, you play what's written, and then you go home. It was quite kind of um, stuffy, and people like Glenn Campbell, uh, they were the first generation who, who had to, they, they, they bought their kind of contemporary edge to the studio with them. And they, they wrote loads of stuff in the studio. So rather than reading what was presented to them, they'd be interpreting and bringing in their kind of contemporary rock and roll edge to this music. So it it really kind of started with those guys. And then you saw people like, uh, Larry Carlton in the seventies playing on Steely Dan records and so, you know, by the time we get to the eighties guys, it's almost like third third generation almost, you know, Steve Luca, Michael Landau, Dan Huff, all those dudes. And and then it, it sort of carried on up to a point, but I'd say that the the eighties through to kind of like the mid nineties could be considered the sort of golden era of session dudes. And then it's kind of as technology got better, um, the necessity to have really amazing musicians decreased. You know, because as it became, you know, easier and easier to to edit stuff, um, or you know, to not have the necessity of going in and hiring a recording studio, the need to have these guys that could come in, nail something in one take, uh, come up with stuff on the fly, just gradually over time, sort of dissipated. Sadly, so for me, that's that's kind of the the fascinating thing about particularly the eighties is that I, I don't, I feel like musicianship is in some areas kind of dipped off a, a little bit from that point you know well i don't i don't think you're necessarily wrong and i don't think it's i, I don't think we should say it i mean there was a report uh, i can't remember which paper it was in it's one is in one of the proper papers guardian telegraph something like that where it had done a, an analysis of oh are we saying the telegraph's a proper paper or is it just a yeah. big paper <laughs> it's a big paper it's not a red top that's fine just 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 sorry carry on yeah, and they'd done an analysis of the complexity of music and the, the basically the cliff that it's fallen off in the last mm. sort of like 10, 15 years particularly that we're now getting down to, you know, a repeating two, three note pattern and that is it. Mm. So there's no real need to hire a Lucather to come along and play on something where it is literally chink, chink, chink. Mm. You know, pretty much anybody can do that. They're sort of like the piano parts that I record when I'm demoing up stuff, you know. <laughs> You can move them around because they're MIDI and stuff. You know, it's fine. Um, mm. So, it's. I think it's. It's partly the, the 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 no need to hire a recording studio, but I also think it's the, the the way that music's gone, and maybe music is going to become more p- complex again, hopefully mm. in the future. Do you think there's something in the fact that through that decade, guitarists who potentially would have been session players before actually became recognized as guitar players that actually the fact that you know 
the, the likes of, you know, be it Satriani's or Vives or what have you, guitar talented guitar players were being recognised as talented guitar players. So maybe these players might have gone under the radar a decade earlier. Yeah, but they but they were actually being talked about. They were being interviewed. That their influence was being recognised. You probably um, see it with the rise of the guitar magazine, though, as well. I mean, I'm not sure there were any guitar magazines in the 70s. Mm. There might have been, like, Practicing Musician or something like that, but I'm fairly certain uh, things like Guitarist and Guitar World started in the 80s. And, of course, they need something and people to write about. Yeah. Uh, well, and and the guitar was in everything as well. I mean, you obviously, you had so many great rock bands in the 80s, but it found its way into most pop music most pop artists had a had a kind of rock phase whether it's like stevie nicks or obviously michael mm. jackson or whoever it was really kind of center stage so yeah i think it did bring those guys to forefront a little bit more and then it kind of uh guitar virtuosity became uncool again you know yeah with with grunge and then we see it sort of fade a bit and these guys also started doing lots of tuition videos you know they, they, it all became but but I guess the point being that, as I say, they were being seen in different places in a way they'd probably never been seen, be, you know, never been seen before. Mm. My favourite tuition video is not to mention Kiss, but mention Kiss, uh, the Vinnie Vincent tuition video, which has clearly <laughs> been sped up. Because, <laughs> because seriously, I haven't seen that yeah. one. Yeah, it's on YouTube. It, it's it's beyond awful. <laughs> Um, but I recommend that you do watch it. The uh, the, the Frank Gambale ones are always a personal favourite, not because of the content, but just because of his war- wardrobe choices. It's just un- <laughs> un- un- unparalleledly <laughs> bad dress sense. <laughs> Incredible. Ah, uh, yes. I had Frank's for a couple of shows. Long time ago now. Must have yeah. been when I was doing it at the NEC. Yeah. In fact, I haven't seen him at NAM or anything for years. I suppose he's just kind of dropped off the radar as you know. He's still he's still going. He's still amazing. He's um he's sporting sort of Hannibal Lecter vibe these days, which I think is very cool. But um yeah, those those eighties instructionals for something else. So good. So what got you into this? What was the that that spark for you? Oh man, I mean, I am. Um, I, I was a bit like you when I the thing that got me into music was Kiss and and Alice Cooper. That was before I even played guitar, you know? Mm. And then my, my first, when I did start playing, the, the thing that did it for me that made me want to start was was hearing Appetite for Destruction. I didn't even know what it was. I had a, my one of my dad's friends who back in his youth was a, com- a complete hellraiser. He used to sort of just like bung me cassette tapes un- unmarked. So I never knew what they were. And uh, I think it had like ACDC on one side and like guns on another. And listen to the ACDC thing. I was like, oh, cool, whatever. Turn it on. And it was the start of Welcome to the Jungle. And yeah. it was kind of it for me. It was one of those literal light bulb moments where I was just like, I don't know what is going on, but I, this is what I want to do, what's happening right now, <laughs> you know? Um, so I, I was a complete like slash and queen nut for my, the first kind of couple of years I was playing. And then my, my folks took me to London to go and watch We Will Rock You because I, I was obsessed with anything Brian May related, you know? Mm. I watched the whole thing. It's cool. And I obviously there for the music and the guitar and stuff. And then at the end of the show, they brought down the musicians from who were in the wings. And I, I watched the whole thing without realizing that it was live music. And when these guys came out, I, I couldn't believe that I'd been listening to people replicating those sounds and playing those parts so perfectly. And again, it was another one of those kind of moments where I was just like, that's what I want to do. Whatever that job is, that's, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, and then I, I it was kind of through that I, when I got to the other side of college and it came to looking at unis and stuff, I, I ended up going to ACM and I went to ACM in Guildford at the time because they had guys like Jamie Humphreys there and Jamie had done We Will Rock You and he'd done stuff with Brian May and he toured with all these guys and at the time it was like him uh Pete Friesian from Alice Cooper's band he's yeah. actually in in the Wayne's World movie when they do the you know we're not worthy yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. and um um uh, Mike Caswell uh, who was who was in LA at the same time as a lot of these guys, and he was like friends with Steve Farris from Mister Mister and 
all those sorts of dudes and it kind of i suppose it, it started there really and i I wasn't necessarily super aware of all the session guys while I was sitting at ACM, but I was having like a lot of tutorials with Mike Caswell and I was kind of absorbing his style, which was this mixture of really looking back, it's like a lot of Jeff Beck, but a lot of Steve Lukather, a lot of Michael Landau. It's sort of feeding my subconscious. I was still into, you know, uh, guitar for the sake of ter terrorizing other guitar players to all the virtuoso <laughs> guys at the time, you know? Um, but then something... I just I don't know I, I can't remember who I discovered I think I think I probably discovered a more modern session guy first called uh, Sean Tubbs who's now like a big YouTube guy as well mm. but back then there was almost nothing on him on, on the internet it was really really hard to find stuff there was like he had one video up and I saw it and it immediately I, I just I'd never heard anything that I liked as much as that and I immediately became quite obsessed with finding out as much as I could about him. And he had like a MySpace page at the time. And I remember he'd listed who his influences were. And these names popped up, like Michael Landau, Lyle Workman, these dudes. And and that was kind of where it started. I, I became really obsessed with exploring the lineage of other guitar players. So I wanted to find out everyone who influenced Sean. And then I went to those guys and looked at who influenced them. And you go back and you go back and you go back. And suddenly you end up with this amazingly rich list of incredible players who have played on everything. And then mm. you discover their discographies and you go to somebody like Landau and he's played on, I don't know how many thousands of records going back to like the seventies up until literally now. And it, it's just, it's amazing because it's, it's all this stuff you've been listening to your whole life. And it's all the same guys. It's all the same, like five dudes playing on all of these records. Um, and I don't know, I, it's, it, it just connects with me in, in, on many, many levels. And I think part of it is just that the, the level of musicianship with him was so high. Um, you know, I always, I couldn't help feeling a little bit disappointed sometimes when I would, I would look to my sort of hero guitar players from sort of, I don't know, guns or bands from that era. And I, I'd see them playing in a context that wasn't their band. And I'd just be a bit like, oh, <laughs> it's, it's, kind of, it's a little bit like underwhelming sometimes, you know, like mm. you see them put out of their comfort zone. And when I found the, the session players, uh, it kind of seemed like there was just nothing they couldn't do really well, yeah. whatever they turned their hands to. I guess it was like the kind of school musician approach, but something about that really, really appealed to me as a musician. So wh whatever it was I was listening to at the time, like I always aspired to try and get somewhere near to just the level of like musicianship those guys had. So that was, that was a very, very long winded waffling answer to your question. <laughs> no, but I mean, you look at the discography of Landau and I was just looking while we were talking at uh, his discography and also uh, Dan Huff's discography and, and that really is an A to Z of everything probably recorded between like 80 and 95 <laughs> that had a reasonable guitar part I mean I mean outside of things that you know with band members and you f you do forget like you said at the beginning how dominant that guitar sound was across pop you know I was looking at things like Laura Branigan and Belinda Carlisle and Michael Bolton and things that you forget how guitar driven those albums were, um, you know, and something, some just some incredible. Stuff. I mean, I still think, um, I still think self control. Laura Brennigan's got an absolute killer guitar riff in it. I think it's phenomenal. I always have thought it was phenomenal. Wrap, you know, wrapped up in a, th a three and a half minute pop song. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, it, it was everywhere. It really was everywhere. And you, you I mean, particularly me, because I, I was obviously pretty young you know coming up in the early 90s and stuff like that and you you realize that these guys were playing on like disney soundtracks and yeah. movies and, and and everything so it really is like they're so they're so interweaved within the fabric of everybody's life really because it it was the it's soundtrack to whatever was going on in that particular decade i think that's why it's so cool well you could make a living i imagine playing on the songs that you know like you said were just on the film soundtracks I mean, think about every single one of those hits that, that became an Uber hit in the eighties that were actually stemmed from a film. Yeah. And there's, and there's guys who, it, it seemed to like, um, 
guys either fell into the camp of kind of making records or doing movie dates. And then some of them would do both. So yeah. there was guys like Dean Parks who would do both and you'd see him on the big pop records, but he'd also do loads of movies. And then there are the guys who mostly do movies like Carl Verhagen, who's another incredible session guy. And these guys are all in their like 60s and approaching 70s now and they're still going and they're still absolutely badass. They're just incredible players. They're so good. I mean, you say that uh, you see some of your heroes outside of the, comfort zone and they're not that good <laughs> which I, I i kind of get that i i just wonder with these session this, this guys, podcast for a start well yeah <laughs> quite almost on a bi-weekly basis yeah. uh, um it's quite interesting because like you know so if you take slash slash is only really good at being slash but he has a ton of charisma mm. which is it's like a different skill set isn't it to landau that's able to bend and fit in and play with anybody <laughs> But no Definitely. one wants to see him with a top hat on, swagger to the front of the stage and play Sweet Child of Mine. Yeah, completely. And it's it it's it and it's absolutely not to undermine the importance of any of those guys because they it was their sound. Like, of course, Slash's thing is that he sounds like Slash, but man, what a thing to sound like. And what a what a writer, you know. It doesn't it doesn't take a thing away from what those guys do within their own context. It's just as amazing you feel both voids don't you because you do play and you know i was looking at pictures of lando earlier and i was like man he looks like he shops at primark um <laughs> and and you don't you kind of get that aesthetic thing as well are, are you kind of like torn on this this path of oh man I, session I was, performer I was, session performer i was so torn about it i had a like a i gave myself a really hard time about it um, over the course of a couple of years where I was really struggling to figure out where where I lived with this because mm. the, the, it's two separate halves of your brain because I, I was really attracted to the musicianship of these session guys. But at the same time, nothing makes me feel anything more than listening to like Nine Inch Nails or like Jeff Buckley or, you know, any of those amazing like 90s acts. So yeah, I had a real kind of sp split personality kind of thing about that. And I, d I don't know at what point it sort of settled, but certainly now, like I feel really lucky to be able to have this, which is kind of my hobby and my like practice. And this is the sort of stuff that I'll sit down and work on by myself and transcribe things for hours and whatever. But also I've always managed to keep up with having a band or being in a band or playing mm. for other people's bands, you know? Um, and to be fair, like a lot of those guys did as well. They had their own things going on on the side. And a lot of them ended up drifting away from sessions because it became too much of the too samey, you know, the same, mm. same thing, same progressions. And even like Lando ended up having some like really intense sounding uh, semi like grunge meet Steve Ray Vaughan project in the 90s called Raging Honkies. So, yeah, yeah, it's but it's almost like different. It's different muscles or different sides of your brain or something it, it, it's different uh, it's hard to explain <laughs> do you think this is part of the fact that almost for any given era any given generation that you need some form of factory to kick pop out in quantity because mm. if you go back if you, I mean, you you probably go back to Tim Panali, but you you work it you work it forward. There's been plenty of different, you know, genres that have that have had a, a production line of material, whether it be mm. dance music, whether it be you know Britpop to a certain extent, whether it was you know the rock and sounding at the point when those genres kind of were the they were the pop mainstream. I mean, I mean, I was just looking around at those some of those lists of of records, and yes. There's the soundtrack of my youth on those records. But I would never put one of those albums on to sit and listen to an album. Same. You, 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 what you're saying is that actually on all those artists, there's two or three tracks and they were the singles and they, they drove the tr charts, they drove the hits albums without a shadow of a doubt. But if you want to go and listen, you know, if I want to go and listen to a, a, a rock album from the 80s, I will pick Guns N' Roses or I will pick Def Leppard or I will pick Bon Jovi because actually from... The beginning to the end, I can listen to every one of the tracks. Yeah, exactly. I, and I think that's the thing. I think that you, you, they both kind of need each other because, you know, 
in that case, that era you're talking about, it's like the rock guys came first. And like yeah. with, with bands like Guns, it's like they were, they were living in their rehearsal space. They were exactly what uh, their, their aesthetic and their story and all that stuff was all lined. And it was so authentic to who they were. And that's what made it so exciting and dangerous and volatile and all this sort of stuff. But then it's this inevitability that happens, this cycle within popular music where something really exciting and amazing will come along and then people cotton on to the fact that it's popular and it becomes the mainstream and suddenly every pop artist has got a rock guitar on yeah. it's exactly the same thing happened in the 90s you know you had a, like a few a few bands that came along and destroyed glam metal in like one fell swoop and then all of a sudden grunge becomes the establishment and all the mainstream clothing retailers are selling flannel shirts and torn jeans and stuff you know so it's it's this ongoing thing that that will, will always happen inevitably like the the innovation comes with the bands and the original artists and then yeah. it will be appropriated by pop and just unfortunately for a while the factory that's been kicking out hasn't required guitar really has it for a while that's the problem no i mean the, the, there is so much great modern music out there it's just not really making its way onto the radio no. um that there are loads of great bands doing really exciting things but it's getting harder and harder to find um because we find music in a different way these days as well you know um we don't it's harder to discover stuff and it's become more kind of secular but i just i have so little interest in what i hear on the radio these days <laughs> i sound like such an old dude saying that but i just <laughs> welcome to the club yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just got there a lot earlier than me and Ant did <laughs> but it's all it all just feels so safe to me uh, it's so and it's so like I hear the same song over and over again. Yeah, you know the same melodies, same top lines because it's like, oh well, we know this worked once, so we'll just do it again and do it again, kind of thing. So you seem to have to search a lot harder to find stuff that's unique and interesting. It's sort of buried away, squirreled away somewhere. And and maybe maybe that was the same in the eighties. Maybe it's not any different. Maybe it's just the fact that in there's a there's an era that you invest in, and so you get closer to it, and you hear the differences mm. between the tracks. But actually, in reality, you know, you could put a Michael Bolton track on in the 80s and then just just take Michael off and put Cher on. Yeah, or take 100%. Cher off and put Belinda Carlisle on or, Linda, or Laura Branning on, whoever. Uh, and actually, the song's probably pretty much the same. Yeah. But I think, I think labels were braver back then as well. I think because there was more, probably, you know, more, more money in the industry and stuff. I think that they were a bit more willing to take risks with stuff and to elevate stuff that might be a little bit more kind of alternative because you had i mean even bands like tears for fears you know mm. amazing not not really like a pop band you know and particularly not when they started it was kind of a bit odd and new wavy and stuff but they 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 were supported and then they became something mm. really big you know i'm a big tears for fears fan i think they were incredible um, yeah me too man and and, it, and, and you're right brave and it, and a very interesting arc if you look at their material arc as well it's uh never stopped developing which is fascinating yeah, yeah. so it kind of leads us on to your own sort of like music of which there are many strands i i think um <laughs> i mean uh, what is it deadwood music is 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 that one of it was a ghost that horrific video that you did which is brilliant <laughs> but truly harrowing harrowing <laughs> yeah video my my, my poor mum cried when i showed her that <laughs> 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 yeah um yeah yeah um i mean ghosts was was my thing that was my like um i don't think i can use the word solo project without wincing but um it was just it was just me really i i i sat and wrote an album by myself and then i got a couple of my friends who are really great drummers to come and do that and then i did everything else and i did the guitars and synths and keyboards and vocals and stuff and that's kind of that, that uh, that's that's the other side of the sort of musical personality coming out you know that's all the heavy stuff the nine inch nails and the cool 90s alternative stuff that so periodically just demands to be let out of the box do you know what i mean i can be doing stuff playing for the people for quite a long time and then usually when i notice that i'm becoming a bit more irritable in my day-to-day -day life it's an indication that i need to go and write some music and that's what's <laughs> come out and it's never it, much as i love 
the eighties guys and the session guys and stuff. I never write like that. That's not what comes out when I sit down to write and it's not what I want to write really, you know? Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's my thing. Um, I'm obviously have like a couple of my other bands, which I'm either in or playing for or whatever. I've got black sky research, which is the thing with, uh, Mikey from used to be Mallory Knox. And we originally had Jason bold from uh, bullet doing drums on that, which is like a bit more of a modern vibe. And then a bit truly mean sounding industrial project called drowned, which is like the quite kind of extreme end of, of, of that spectrum. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't do any one of those things all the time. You know what I mean? If, if I was chugging and throwing myself around and doing that stuff all the time, I'd start to become musically frustrated because I'd feel like I wasn't challenged enough. And at the same time, I need that stuff from like an artistic output. So it's, it's just balancing it and sort of spinning the plates really. Did you, did you tour ghosts? <laughs> we started <laughs> and then the pandemic happened uh mm. yeah we'd, we'd we'd it'd been incubated for like a couple of years while i was just writing stuff and um i'd done I'd, I'd i'd been doing it through music videos and stuff i think i'd done about four before i even put a band together around it and then we did put a band together and we did start going out and playing it live and then at the literally i think it was the week that i release the album because it had been set up in advance through AWOL and stuff. I think that's when we had our first lockdown. I was like, oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> that's that then. Because it's like, you know, the world's falling into chaos. And you're just like, hey, guys, I uh, got, an album, got an album out. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> it, I mean, it's interesting, you know, the people we've spoken to that, you know, have got projects that had been held. Yeah. Uh, mm. uh, particularly over the first sort of lockdown, they were like, oh, we'll just delay them and put them out later in the year. And then, you know, we we career into lockdowns two, lockdowns three, and all of a sudden albums start kind of seeping out. And I suppose because artists have been sat at home and they've written the follow up and potentially the follow up to that in this period <laughs> of time. And it's kind of like, oh, I just need to get this stuff out, really. And I think in some cases it's worked quite well. I mean, there's been a lot of that lockdown gigs and, and so on done. Is, did you consider doing anything like that? It was just used as a a period to incubate certain projects really i mean the the stuff that we probably did most with in that period was with black sky research where we went and wrote and recorded the whole of like our first ep which we put out and then we started writing the second ep and then we filmed a whole like uh pro shot live set in vader studios and their big like church looking live room so we yeah we we're kind of the same thing we amassed like a lot of material in that time which we're now sort of sitting on and you know it'll be released sort of gradually but i mean f from that perspective it was like a really nice period it was and, and i don't think we'll probably ever experience anything like that again where you, actually something disrupts your normal way of life entirely to the point where you actually can stop and have a quick look at your life and i, I in that period, I also stopped doing lots of stuff because when you can kind of hop off the merry-go-round, um, you can kind of reassess and go, well, am I doing exactly what I want to be doing? Or is there some stuff that I've just got into the habit of doing all the time because that's what you do. You're a musician, you're mm. busy all the time, you know? So from that, from that perspective, it was a really nice, interesting period because I was able to step back from some of the things that I just, I'd you know almost on the verge of burnout with how much i was gigging and stuff and actually made a conscious decision to just refocus on doing the sort of music that i really love doing and that's when these projects started you know doing more it's a bit of thing with you though right because you, you your solo stuff is now starting to be gigged and you've it is. been recording <laughs> stuff on the down low so you've kind of had like a similar sort of seems like it's happened in the same period uh yeah i mean i'd done an album prior to lockdown mm -hmm. um I, basically I, I i was in a band and the band kind of split up and i kicked around for 18 months going got all these songs what do i do and um just went in and recorded them got three mates into to, that weren't in the band with me um and, and really enjoyed that it I honestly loved the kind of they don't play my kind of music so whatever they bought was completely different whereas 
previously the guitarist would say, oh, I'm playing it like that because I know you like that band. And it's like, yeah, I do like that band, but I don't necessarily want my own stuff to sound like that band. <laughs> what we end up then is being a copy of that band because I've yeah. taken the songwriting influences. But, you know, so I work with different musicians, completely different music tastes. I really loved working with the drummer that when I went, mm, I don't really like that drum beat, he, he went, oh, well, OK, how about this one? Whereas when you've been in a band in the past and you said to the drummer, I don't like that drum beat, the drummer's initial response is always, well, I don't like your fucking song. <laughs> you know, and it was so nice to deal with someone who went, oh, OK, how about this one? Um, and, and then that kind of that kind of sat and uh, I did the, the classic thing of I got 30, uh, 50 CDs pressed because that was the minimum. Um, I've still got about 20 of them in a box somewhere. <laughs> um, and then I just started writing some more and it's been it's been very much a kind of piecemeal I've recorded two or three songs in between lockdowns two and three sort of thing I, I did one a couple of weeks ago i mean on sunday to do another one mm-hmm. um and and i kind of i suppose the point is i collect them all up and i've I've got five that are recorded now so i put do those in as an ep and then do another five and then just stick it together in and actually get some more cds pressed because i'm old and i like cds <laughs> because <laughs> um, I listen to CDs in the car all the time uh, and I like them and I like owning a product um, it, but it has been really it's been kind of interesting I lost a lot of mojo for writing towards the end of the lockdowns I was just kind of like mm. what is the point you know I seem to be flogging myself to death over the university work that I do because that was so intense yeah. um, over lockdown and didn't do anything for the guitar show. And then I think, in all honesty, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't even consider it depression. I just got really quite low with mm. the guitar show and it just kind of sucked all the joy of the guitar out of it. I read a lot of books about guitarists and guitars that didn't play very much. You can be easily become oversaturated in it, can't you? When, mm. when that's particularly, I think for you, that's such like a big part of your year. Yeah. So you're thinking about it all the time and, liaising with these people all the time you know so I, I can completely understand that i think also like you know you you need to have new stimulus and new experiences to prompt you into writing sometimes you need to be just pushed in a con- completely different kind of headspace in order to do it do you know what kind of got me going recently um i just read um bob dylan's um chronicles volume one okay and it's just an amazing book. I mean, it's the most random autobiography you've ever read. Like, starts, I don't know, three years into his career. Then then the next chapter's like 10 years into a career. Then the next chapter's another 10 years on. Then the next chapter's the start of his career. It's just, it's not linear. Mm. They're just kind of stories. And I, I, and I really like Bob Dylan, but I only really like a period of Bob Dylan. Um, but I just found it, I don't know, just found it... It gave me a little kick, you know. I mean, the bloke's written like thousands of songs. I've written maybe 150, of which 20 are all right. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm sure he's written thousands and thousands that were terrible as well. But, you know, he's Bob Dylan, maybe not. Um, but that's kind of got me started. And having COVID a couple of weeks ago, um, which in the whole of this pandemic was the first time I'd actually stopped. Because mm. um, I was like... My brain didn't work properly. Um, I had really disrupted sleep as well, uh, which was the the only real side effect that I got, Mm. that I found myself sat here at um, 3 a.m. writing lyrics. Uh, (laughs) I have no idea why. Um, But if that's one of the side effects of uh, my COVID, um, that's not too bad, right? (laughs) (laughs) I wish that was on my side effects. I just had a headache. Uh, uh, Yeah. (laughs) I, I, yeah i mean i did have a headache for the first day like pounding terrible headache for the first day um and then it was just weird sleep patterns so mm. i don't know you know could have been much much worse but you know i'm triple jabbed um i'm relatively healthy so you know not the worst thing in the world no <laughs> so rich what's what's next um Oh, I mean, like all, all all that stuff is ongoing, really. So in terms of projects and stuff, that's we're still, you know, in the process of writing like a second release for BSR, and my stuff's kind of 
pause at the moment because the main thing for this year is um, doing a, a course for my Session Heroes thing, which has been something I've been planning for ages and I'm kind of part way through at the moment. But um, I suppose a little bit in the spirit of like the old VHS instructional tapes that used to come out in the 80s, but a lot more in depth rather than kind of teaching people parts by these guys or solos and stuff it's really breaking it down into like the concepts that they used from like a a, a musical and kind of theoretical point of view what do we see them doing a lot when they're on these recording sessions how do they think about soloing how do they think about part writing and trying to sort of i suppose teach it to people in a way where they they can apply it to their own stuff you know because it's it's cool it's cool teaching people how to play a solo they love that's fine but it's not always super malleable in terms of great they can play that thing but can you <laughs> can you take those ideas and can you put them into lots of different contexts can you use it when you're improvising so yeah that's that's kind of going to be my my summer project um really i've i've already kind of got most of it written um it's going to be like 20 different concepts i've got uh three full tracks written in slightly different styles of like 80s pop session stuff i've got um magic martin johnson um playing on the drum backing track got tim bradshaw doing all the keys and synth stuff on it um, i should say for those people that don't know uh magic johnson um plays drums for loads of artists he's his most recent gig was playing in like russia with sam fox i think um which is amazing and tim bradshaw is david gray's keyboard player Who's also played for John Mayer and all all sorts of folks. And John and John Mayer, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a bit mental, really. Uh, it's crazy. Um, but yeah, so it's it's going to be that really. It's going to be um, kind of continuing to do the sort of YouTube thing while working on that. That's kind of like the main focus for this year, outside of the bands and the teaching and sessiony stuff. Yeah. Any more uh, UK country collective? Funny enough, uh, I. Yeah, uh, Tim has just asked me to do some shows with him. Uh, he wants me to do the country to country shows in London. Oh, um, cool! I mean, they're massive, aren't they? Yeah, uh, next month. So I need to hop in with his band. Um, he's just sent me all the tracks over, and then um, I'm also doing like another one called Buckle and Boots with him. Oh, in, that's in up north, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So a bit, a bit more sessiony stuff as well, which would be really fun. And interestingly, coming back round, and we talked obviously a little bit earlier about where you know where rock became mainstream and and then planted you know planted itself in pop. And to a certain extent, I I I, I thought for a while, a few years ago, rock had landed in country, and that's exactly where it it was now. When you listen to some of the bands that were kicking around at the time, it is it, modern country is seventies rock with some yeah. more electronics in basically. It seems like that's where, like, you, we, you were talking about the, I think, Jace, you mentioned, like, the article we read about the complexity in pop music mm. sort of, like, decreasing over time. I think a lot of that stuff found its way into modern country, Nashville songwriting stuff. That's where a lot of, like, the good song writers <laughs> seem to have, like, migrated to. So, yeah, 100% modern country is very much cool 70s rock music mixed with, you know, I, I'm, fasc I'm fascinated by the whole, I mean, both me and Ant um, quite like country music, possibly different bits of it, but we both kind of come from the Stones were the first alternative country band, if you like. And I, I know there's quite a few people, there's Steve from Blackstar uh, with his band, uh, Gasoline and Matches. Uh, and, and, you know, and there's, there's Roy at the um, uproar venue in Birmingham that started a country night, sort of a once a month sort of thing. And we're all kind of convinced that country will break through. It just seems to be butting up against the mainstream and just not quite getting through that barrier at the moment. But it does seem to be like the next big thing. Really. It's definitely bubbling. There's definitely a scene. Um I used to be in a band with Steve, with with Tim, the guy from the UK Country Collective. Thing. Right. It was a, the three of us had to like an alternative kind of country project, and yeah, there's lo there's loads of cool stuff going on. I don't know whether it will ever break its way into the charts, so to speak, but there's definitely like a big following for it for sure. I've only got uh, one more question. Okay, Dave. And um, what's with the triangles? I've never asked you. What's the triangles? <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm going to give you the answer that I give to the students when I don't want to give them the real answer, which is in case I forget where my uh, hands are when I'm on stage, just reminds me. Of the time <laughs> <laughs> i've asked that so many times man <laughs> so yeah i always give them a, my bullshit answer but um yeah okay yeah. you're not going to tell us <laughs> <No. before. laughs> no, i'm gonna i'm gonna give you the student one yeah <laughs> well in which case rich thank you very much for making making the time uh, no pleasure thank it's, you for having it's me. been lovely it's been lovely to chat um and obviously also nice to get an insight into mudlarking and metal detecting <laughs> um, which I need to be careful I don't put the link on the show notes to um, no you should <laughs> and, and while we're at it um, 20 copies of the album still to go Jace do you want to do you want to put a plug in for that now or are you assuming they're never going to get sold uh, uh, no they're never going to get sold uh, <laughs> okay in fact uh, my two daughters gave me their copies back because they don't have CD players <laughs> right and that's what they told you is it <laughs> That's okay. I don't care. Uh-huh. I didn't do it for any reason other than that I wanted to do it. We um we we have been contemplating for a while whether we open a uh, a Patreon channel up and maybe <laughs> maybe that's the gift for the first 20 patrons is a copy of 22 obviously now. Now we've got 22 back is uh, is a copy of your album. No. Um or maybe what we say is that if you're one of the first 20 that gets him signs up, you don't get yeah. sent a copy. And actually, uh, the danger is in being between 22 and 40. I'm not quite sure. Right. That's enough. Thank you, Ant. All right. Must, okay. Remember to uh, thank Focus Right for sponsoring 9042. Um, thanks, guys. Currently yes, using a 2 y 2 right here, right now. Right here, right now. Do you use Focus Right gear at all, Rich? Uh, I, I don't have any at the moment. No, I don't actually, sadly. Okay, well, I'll, I'll edit that out then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thanks again. Have a good night. Everybody, we'll speak to you again soon. Thank Cheers. you. Thanks for having Bye. me. Bye. Thanks for listening to 9 to 42, the podcast from the team at the Guitar Show UK. If you've enjoyed the show, then please remember to hit the subscribe button and share with other like-minded souls. For more information about 9 to 42, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at the Guitar Show UK. This has been an A Short Stories production. Hold up. 